Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's Tuesday night. It's March 30th, 2021. And we're excited to be here tonight with the panel to start a discussion on gun violence in South Carolina. As many of you know, we've, um, I'm Jelena Oxley, and I'm the co-founder of Grand Strand Action Together. And we've been hosting a number of Facebook Live discussions on uh, various issues um, since the pandemic started. And tonight we're going to be devoting our time to a very important topic in South Carolina, which is, which is legislation and gun violence in South Carolina. So we have uh, a number of panelists with us tonight. I'll introduce them in a second. I'm very grateful to have one of my uh, founding members tonight, our secretary, Am Amber Knowles, who's gonna be helping me out and um, uh, have it, guiding the discussion with our panelists tonight. So if you uh, have time, go ahead and take a seat and um, get ready for your questions. We have a great panel tonight. So let me go ahead and introduce you to um, our group. So we have with us tonight, Ashley Cowan, uh, one of my colleagues at CCU. And Ashley is a, an Everytown Gun Safety Senior Survivor Fellow and Everytown for Gun Safety Survivor Leader Working Group. So that's her, her jobs with respect to uh, uh, gun legislation and um, activism. Our second guest tonight is T. Her voices and action deputy chapter lead for South Carolina chapter and a survivor fellow with every town survivor network. Issues. Our final guest tonight is Marcel Ross and um, she is a local group co-lead for Moms Demand Action. Is everybody there? Okay, I think we're, yes. sorry about that. Was I frozen? Yeah, you were frozen. Yeah. And I forgot I was on mute. Oh, God. It, this is terrible. No, I was totally frozen. I, was I frozen like one of those like... <laughs> <laughs> terrible faces sorry no. about that <laughs> so where did I freeze and I'll just keep going I don't know I think you might need to start the introductions over <laughs> okay I'll just start the introductions over <laughs> sorry about that everybody uh, I think my kids are watching tv they're sucking down my internet I might have to go <laughs> tell them to stop um so I'll just start again with Ashley. So Ashley Cohen is Every Town for Gun Safety Senior Survivor Fellow and Every Town for Gun Safety Survivor Leader Working Group. Um, Tisa Wack is the co-founder of We Are Their Voices um, and Moms Demand Action Deputy Chapter Lead for the South Carolina Chapter. And she is a Survivor Fellow with Every Town Survivor Network. Our final guest tonight is Marcel Ross. Marcel is the Myrtle Beach local group co-lead for Moms Demand Action. And additionally, they serve as, she serves as the local data lead and the local legislative lead. lead. So thank you all for being with us tonight. And we're really excited to get started. So I think our first question that um, we'd like to ask you guys is, um, how did you get started in this activism? Why or how did you get inv involved in gun violence prevention? I guess I'll take that one um, and uh, get us started. Um, I had written down my whole speech thing and I just don't feel like this is a speech type of forum. So I'm gonna some, summarize a little bit about how I got involved and um violence and it over if that works for you <laughs> okay perfect if that's okay so I have been a gun violence survivor since 1999 um, when my very close college friend um, bought a handgun and took his life with it on the same day um in a effort to kind of 
work through that loss and work through that trauma, I went into his death kind of propelled me into higher ed as a career, which is how I know Joanna. <laughs> um, I work at Coastal and I've been working in higher education since professionally since 2005 when I graduated with my master's in higher education, educational leadership. And that took me back to our alma mater. So Corey and I met at Virginia Tech and my path led me back to Virginia Tech in 2005. And then two years later, I was running for my life um, during the mass shooting. So I um, very vaguely remember those couple of days. Uh, the thing I remember the most is hearing from another student, the shooter is on his way to Burris. And that's the building I worked in. And it turns out that was incorrect information. He was on his way to Norris, which was next door to Burris, which is where he completed his murder spree that killed 32 people, uh, injured, shot and injured 17 more, and then obviously impacted countless other, other individuals and other people. And my office looked into Norris. Uh, my coworkers watched this entire thing happen. Um, it's a really long story and it wouldn't do it any justice at all um, in a short period of time for me to tell my entire tale with that. But the short version is I, I just kind of shut down. Um, I kind of flipped into this professional role and just did this kind of from the sidelines thing and trauma beget trauma beget trauma and, and just it just happened. <laughs> my life kind of took many different paths and unhealthy paths, mentally very unhealthy paths. I always say I'm a non-physically injured, but mental, mentally injured survivor of a school shooting. That's kind of how I narrow how I got involved in this work. And it took over a decade. It took till the shooting at Las Vegas um, for the concert that the shooting was there um, for me to just kind of snap for lack of a better word and just get really upset really angry. My, my spouse at the time woke me up and told me about it. And I just lost it because concerts had been kind of my makeshift therapy for a decade. I went to concerts. I went to live music. I kind of lost myself in arts and they were just gone for me all of a sudden. So um, literally the day after I connected with a friend who was a local leader in North Carolina. I moved here from North Carolina, um, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. I keep going south. Um, Anyway, I connect with her the next day and said, what can I do? I just, I need to do something. And I got involved that next day and it's been kind of a trajectory ever since. And here I am on the panel. Part of my platform personally are like longitudinal support for mass violence survivors, all violence survivors. So I don't want it to come across like I just had that one little narrow thing because gun suicide takes up about 60%, so about two thirds of gun deaths in this country and mass shootings, school campus shootings are less than one, <clears throat> less than 1%. So I had this gigantic chunk of this pie chart and this teeny tiny skinny little chunk of this pie chart and one gets a lot more attention than the other. Um, and then the other thing is those of you that are <laughs> looking at this can see this, those of you that may be listening to this, um, I'm a white woman and the, Gun violence in our country, in our state, in our county, in our city disproportionately impacts communities of color. I do not look like the majority of what gun violence is. So that's why I'm here. I'm literally here to use the privileges I have to accept the mic, <laughs> accept the platform, and, and then step off and, and, and let other people share their story, and which is what I'm going to do now and let Tisa share as well. Thank you, Ashley. Hey, Ashley, thank you for sharing your story as um, we've worked together for um, a good bit now. We forged a friendship through um, some tragedies. Um, um, as introduced, my name is Tisa Wack and I am a survivor of gun violence. And you may ask, how, do I, how did I become a survivor of gun violence? Um, I lost my son, my only child, to gun violence in, on November 30th, 2015. Um, he was shot along with a friend of his and both their lives were taken. Um, at the point of being notified of my son's death, which was a, um, just a Monday after Monday evening, the, it was the Monday after Thanksgiving. We had just spent a wonderful weekend in Georgia with my dad. 
Um, we had lost my mother in January of that year. So it was really a time where we, the holidays are coming. It's going to be the first time without my mom. And we were trying to try to mercy in our lives, um, not knowing that that weekend would be the last weekend that I would spend with my son. Um, my son Tyrell was a father. He was a newlywed. He had just married his wife, his high school sweetheart in July of that year. Um, he had a two-year-old son who turned three, four days after he was murdered. Um, in the midst of planning a funeral, we were also trying to acknowledge my grandson's birthday because as a two-year-old about to turn three, he didn't recognize the fact that all this was going on and that his father was gone. Um, not to come back again. He just had the conception of um, perception that his father just went to the store and would be back. You know, I remember that night that my son was um, killed and I remember the coroner coming to the office along with detective and telling us that um, Tyrell was, um, was fatally shot, was shot and then unfortunately did not survive. Um, I remember the people coming to the house and as the news kind of spread through the community, through family and friends. And I remember the house being so crowded, but yet I felt like I was by myself. Um, but you could hear the noise. I, I remember my sisters, <clears throat> I have two sisters, not wanting to leave me alone because they were just fearful. I mean, this was my only child. I mean, it's one thing to lose someone, but to lose a child at the age of 23 years old, um, as a parent, you never think you have to bury your child. Um, I remember sleeping in the closet that night, slept in the walk-in closet because it was the quietest and darkest place that I could imagine because one, I felt as though I could hide from the reality of what was going on outside that door. Um, and through the scenes, you know, the, the days that came forth, you know, the planning, the detectives, the, you know, just the what happened and the whys. Um, I, I finally woke up one day and not literally the next day, but woke up and said, I have to do something. Um, I'd been already involved in my community when it came to gun violence and just community support because um, my son's friend had lost his life to gun violence in 2014. It was an incident in Myrtle Beach um, where three local kids were murdered and they were all from my community. And we rallied together then. Um, and through the midst of it, I, I met a friend who kind of really brought it out of me. Um, she lost her son, her only child, the gun violence. She'd reached out to me the days, the months after my, like the next month after my son was killed. And she knew how I was feeling. It was her only child. Her son had a daughter who was born four days after he died. So our lives were really parallel. And it's like, we needed each other in order to survive um, because we could understand what we were both going through. And through that, after, um, you know, about a year or so of us knowing each other, we came to the um, conclusion, we always talked about being our son's voices. So we ended up creating an um, organization called We Are Their Voices because we didn't just want to be the voices of our children. We want to be the voices of all people affected by gun violence and, and let people know that the reality of it is at the end of each night, and we've seen it over the past few weeks, you see the headlines, you see the stories, you see them highlight the families. And a month from now, what happens? We, we lift in thoughts and prayers again, but we are real people. And we have to live this over and over every day. And, you know, something me and Ashley's talked about uh, in constant conversation is the re-traumatization that we suffer when we see these things on the news. Um, like I said, I got involved. My, I've heard about Moms Demand Action, would always see, and something just kept me like, I would kind of keep my thumb on them and kind of look and see what are these ladies doing. Um, and one day I just showed up at a meeting. And from there, you know, I was embraced with a, um, or organization that understood that gun violence didn't just affect my community or the surrounding communities. It was a problem or a issue that needed to be addressed across the country. Um, and I became the community chapter lead for um, my local um, chapter in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and now I serve as the um, state deputy lead for state of South Carolina as well as um, like actually a um, Every Town Survivor Network fellow. And what we do is we, we, we embrace our stories and we have the courage to talk about it. Um, you, know, you know, it's been five years that my son has been gone. And a lot of times um, in recent conversation with some friends, we talked about people using the term 
loss to gun violence, but loss is not the correct word because you lose your keys. You lose your wallet. They were taken from us. We had no, we had, we had, we can't replace them. Like we replaced a set of keys or a driver's license lost on a wallet. So we need everyone to recognize that at any given time that their lives can change due to the impact of gun violence. And that's why we choose to tell our story. So that is how I got involved um, with this gun violence advocacy work. And if I can change someone's perception of the effects of it, then my son Tyrell's name will not be taken in vain. Thank you. Thank you, Tisa. My heart goes out to you. That's a really powerful story and just heartbreaking. I can't imagine losing a child and I know how painful that must be to, to for somebody to life to be stolen far sooner than it, than it should have been. So um, yeah, so thank you for sharing. I mean, I think that these stories are really important for like helping people understand like why people care about gun violence and why they care about legislation because they've been personally affected. And, you know, that we can do better, right? We can do better as a country. We don't have to be the nation that has the highest gun violence rate, you know, in the world. <laughs> so, um, so we can do better. Marcel, did you wanna tell us about how you got into this work? Um, well, briefly, um, I'm, I was a public educator, and um, when the shooting took place in Aurora, Colorado, I was teaching in uh, Salt Lake City, and there was kind of a knee-jerk reaction from many of our state lawmakers that the way to make schools safer was to place guns into the hands of teachers, mm. and of course, I was just, um, from the beginning, knew that that wasn't going to solve any problems at all. And so um, I was really super busy teaching all those years. But when finally I retired and moved to Myrtle Beach uh, area about eight years ago, um, I'd always been interested in politics. But when I learned about Moms Demand Action and just was impressed by the stories of survivors like Ashley and Tisa, and uh, just the amazing uh, amount of resources that every town for gun safety and mom and demand action can provide and can use to educate uh, citizens in our state as well as throughout our nation. I just wanted to get involved. Yeah, uh, yeah. So very important. I do have a, um, you know, I, I was a, I am a survivor of gun violence as well. But I was quite small. I had a uncle that committed suicide using a gun. And it was a pretty traumatic experience for me, um, you know, my father's brother. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, over time, I fortunately was able to kind of work through a lot of the anxiety that I felt at that time. But I did see it tear apart my family for many years. So, uh, um, you know, I'm a survivor as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I think maybe at the end, I'll have you guys share a little bit more just about gun, about Moms Demand Action and how people can get in, involved with it. But I think I'm going to just save that to the end. Right now, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to tell us, for you guys to tell us some ideas about um, what you think can be done. And I think as we know that um, the vast majority of American citizens support reasonable gun legislation. And I don't mean like taking away people's guns or a registry or anything, just like, you know, tracking who has a gun, ownership, uh, you know, background checks, all the kinds of reasonable, um, you know, steps to take. But then it comes to the legislators that the NRA seems to really have kind of a lock on um, legislators voting in favor for any of those things. What do you think that can be counteract influence of the NRA on, on gun legislation these days? I'll let anybody speak, whoever. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kind of immediate things that um, that we work on. And, and one of the reasons I personally got involved in it was for the, the purpose of background checks. Um, I, I wanna make, yeah, you, you pointed out, Jol Jolena, that you know this isn't every town and, and mom's demand. I think one of the common things we, I know I get pushed back on it when I talk about this. Um, and I'm certain Marcel and Tisa get pushed back on. Um, we're not, this isn't an anti-2A 
uh, organization. This is a gun violence prevention organization. And for me personally, um, it's about bringing common sense legislation and common sense re regulations. I, I don't know if that's the right word and probably not the buzzword we want to use, but it is for me. I think about my friend who bought his gun the same day as he took his life with it. And even a pause, even a day pause could have I mean, we, we, we what F ourselves till we're, you know, blue in the face. But I think about that. We were having a party that night as, as a group of friends. I mean, I was a college student. I was 20. I work with college students. You work with college students. I think about that. Like we were having a party. We were waiting for him to show up. And instead that day he bought a gun and drove away. And I think just even a brief pause in the wanting of and the getting of could have could have saved his life and changed the path of so so many people. Um, I am close with his family, well, his sister, and she's mentioned to me, and this is just kind of the story aspect. This is, this is why I do this, because I can tell kind of a personal piece as opposed to really talk stats and data. But I, his sister shared with me that his family had a difficult time even reading the application for that weapon. And when they saw it, they knew something was wrong. And, and how could someone behind a counter necessarily know that something's wrong? And I just go back to that kind of pause and, and asking for this amount of time and asking for kind of checks and balances in providing somebody a firearm in, in a variety of ways, kind of like we do, I guess, with maybe vehicles and, and some of the other things that we've we've worked towards. I mean, we haven't, but as a country, we've worked towards. But before I kind of dig myself a hole, <laughs> I'm going to let Tisa or Marcel come in with probably a much more educated, less personal, less uh, mm, uh, intense way of putting it and, and back me up here. <laughs> well, I don't know if I have a um, more, um, you know, a better answer. I, I honestly would agree with you, Ashley, because, you know, just something as simple as, um, allowing additional time to make sure background checks are made because you know when someone's in an emotional state they may make of course they make impulsive decisions so that extra time that they may have to make that decision because one thing about background check is going to be one of three things it's going to be a yes immediately it's going to be a no immediately it's going to wait and if you if you don't have any ill intent towards purchasing then if you tell me to wait seven days versus three days it shouldn't be a problem. And, I, I, and, and that's one thing about the organization that we work with and even my personal nonprofit, we, we wanna emphasize you know, the effects, but the, the safety that comes with it. Because when you think about the incident where someone is in a impulsive state, they make a rash decision, they buy a gun, they commit suicide, or they do something, do harm to someone else. But then also you think about the aspect of, you know, safety with kids. I mean, that's one of the other things that we focus on because you want to make sure that your children um, don't have access to um, guns. You want to make sure that they're stored safely. You want to teach that proper storage. And because at, at the end of the day, like we believe in the second amendment. No, we, you have the right to bear arms, no problem, but do it responsibly. And, and also just waiting those few days, it's not something that should be considered a an infringement on your rights. I mean, we wait, I mean, literally we wait for everything. I mean, we wait for a cup of coffee in the line at Starbucks for how long? I mean, but we can't wait for things like a background check to pass. I mean, I mean, although, you know, Chick-fil-A has a line wrapped around the building, they move quickly, but you know, <laughs> life doesn't work like a Chick-fil-A drive-through line. Um, sometimes we have to wait on things. We have to be patient. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that needs to be stated. Um, and I think sometimes the NRA makes it seem like uh, people who are trying to bring awareness to the um, responsibility of ownership. Responsibility comes with um, how you own it, how you store it. Um, you know, you don't leave guns in. You know, most people say we have a high break-in rate for um, cars and gun thefts. But when you leave the door unlocked, it's really not called a break-in. It's called I opened the door and took what I want. <laughs> So, I mean, just those types of things, you know, just holding people accountable, you know, that's, that's a, that's a major, a major, I mean, driver's license, you know, you have, you operating a vehicle that can, could possibly harm someone. So treat it in that same respect. And you, when we have lots of gun owners that do treat it in that respect and 
you'd be surprised at how many are actually advocating for the same thing we are advocating for, but sometimes it's perceived as negative in, in a sense that we want to take something away. And that's not the truth. Um, yeah. 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 That's, that's exactly what I was going to say, Tisa. Some of our biggest allies in this work are the responsible gun owners that understand you store this properly. Um, you lock your car, you, you, you store the ammunition separately from the way, you know, it, it, that they're some of our biggest allies are the ones talking about that love their, love their guns. They love to shoot. They love to go to the range. They love to hunt, um, whatever it may be. Um, but they want to do that responsibly. They want to model it, model responsibility to their, to their kids. They want to model responsibility to other people. We have a program with Moms Demand Action in every time called Be Smart. And right now, I cannot remember the acronym to save, <laughs> save my brain. <laughs> but um, it's, and one of, my, one of my colleagues could probably jump in and, and help me out here. But the whole point of Be Smart is exactly, is exactly this, is, is modeling of responsible behavior. So that's a program that we, that we do and that we focus on. And um, I've met some incredible former um, military and um, former law enforcement or current law enforcement that are that are advocates and allies in this work um, because of that. We have strong allies in um, the medical uh, profession as well because they see the end result of a lot, a lot, way too many um, of gun, gun violence. So um, that's something that's for sure I wanted to point out. I don't know the history of the NRA, but I've gotten the impression from just listening to the just the news that historically they weren't as strident as they are today mm -hmm. about, you know, just so extreme and not wanting any form of change at all to increase public safety. And um, They've promoted a lot of myths and a lot of myths people believe, including our lawmakers. And um, when I was speaking to one of our lawmakers actually um, about two years ago in Columbia, um, I heard one of these myths, criminals will always find a way to get their hands on a gun. Um, one thing that's really impressive, if you go to the Moms Demand Action website, there is a, um, a a, a section on the website that is debunking gun myths mm -hmm. and it was actually encouraging you might do this over you know a uh, family holiday but it, it is amazing that um so many myths are out there about gun violence that prevent us from making these common sense policies that would make a difference of course they're not going to solve all of the gun violence issue because you know, we know this is suicides, it's homicides, it's mass shootings, mm -hmm. but it's almost like it's paralyzed so many of our lawmakers mm -hmm. there, you know, as if these myths are out there. So I think part of our job as gun sense advocates is to help educate the public. So first educate ourselves. I, I mean, I'm some of the myths I believed as well. And, you know, and I've always felt like the gun ownership should be responsible ownership. But mm -hmm. I think that's part of it is the myths are out there and until they're, until they're debunked, we're gonna have trouble convincing the general public. And then of course the general public can put pressure on lawmakers, which has happened, you know, in Virginia is a perfect example where major changes have taken place in the state of Virginia. There has been pushback, but you know, Right now, they, Virginia's moving in the right direction uh, as far as gun violent, gun sense, you know, legislation. And hopefully we'll see, a, you know, they'll see a major reduction in gun violence in their state as these policies and laws go into place. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, I, I did read a little bit about that, but can you just summarize really quickly what some of those laws were passed and are other states considering doing these? I know in South Carolina, we're kind of moving the opposite direction. It seems like, actually, maybe we can talk about that first. We can contrast the state of South Carolina with the state of Virginia. What is it, this, there's an open carry bill. Can, can somebody just say a little bit about that, about what that bill in the South Carolina legislature is proposing and sort of where it is in the process? 
I'd be glad to speak about that. Okay. So initially, we uh, we identified Bill uh, House Bill 3094, which is called Open Carry with Training. So there was a push to, as long as you, uh, this bill would allow anyone that has that we have a current currently we have a permitting system in South Carolina. So if a individual passed that training and received a permit, they would be allowed to open carry. Um, and it did have many co-sponsors in the house, in our state house, and it ended up passing the house on the 18th of March, 73 to 26. So it passed very easily. And now it has been referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee where it sits right now. So it has not come to the floor of the House, it's in Judiciary Committee. And, um, you know, it would permit business owners as well as individuals to, uh, you know, state that they will not allow uh, weapons on their property, their concealed weapons or open carry on their property. But there are many, for businesses, there are a lot of requirements for that signage to be considered, I guess, legal. And it, the, as the bill did move through the House, it was amended. There was uh, some great concern about uh, open carry in the case that uh, an area might have, um, you know, a parade or a demonstration and having people nearby with, you know, openly displaying their weapons. So there was an amendment that would allow uh, municipalities to make a ruling that they would not permit, you know, the open carry of weapons at a particular event like a parade or demonstration. But then the other bill that now has risen up is back to what we usually have been fighting, which is permitless carry, which would mean that um, an individual that obtains a gun, whether it was by through a background check, through a federally licensed dealer, or if they bought it over the internet or a private sale without even a background check at all, uh, and, uh, and no training would be required at all, no safety training, so you wouldn't have to know about the laws of, of the state. Uh, so that's back on the you know, agenda again. It has right now 39 co-sponsors in the House, uh, our state house, uh, they're all Republicans. And uh, it did pass the House Judiciary Committee uh, back on the 17th of March. And uh, now there is a request that it be put onto the floor of our state house. So um, the Senate is where we, in the past, we've been able to block uh, legislation that we view as dangerous. And so it looks like that's where we're heading again for the, this session. I mean, it seems to me that it's in the interest of the entire society and of our state to require people, if they're going to open carry, to have a permit, to have training. I fundamentally don't understand why any citizen, no matter what you're, like you're putting your own life at risk, it seems, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. By not requiring anything. Um, it's like kind of asking to be living in the wild west again. Um, you know, I, I like watching those movies, but I personally don't want to live in a world where I go up to the Walmart and everybody's packing heat. I mean, that's not where I want to have my kids. That's not where I want to just be able to pop into the grocery store and like there's like there's a shoot on uh, out on aisle 10. So um, I guess I don't understand the incentive for that. So or the, the motivation for it partially um, other than like just to push in another direction or something like that. But um, can you, I, I also don't understand what background checks over the internet aren't required. I, I guess I just, and I, I know that also if you go to a, a gun show like in town where they have them, that apparently that you can purchase um, firearms without any background checks there. So it, it seems to me that the system is, is broken and inconsistent. It's like saying, well, you, can, you, you need to have a driver's license if you're gonna drive out on Highway 501, but if you're gonna drive on the interstate, you don't need one. 
or you don't need one on this back country road, but you know, you do need one for this, like that, that doesn't help anything. If you've got inconsistent, you know, licensing all over the place, that just muddies up the water and gunks up the system. So, uh, it's like there's a lot of room for improvement <laughs> mm-hmm. in, for that system. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in in, in an average year, 908 people die in um, so about 1,700 wounded by guns in South Carolina. You know, right now, South Carolina has South- the 13th highest rate of gun violence in the U.S. That's 13 out of, you know, we're 13. That's the top 20. It's not a good place to be. Could we be top 20 in education? <laughs> I know, right? Definitely treat that. (laughs) Yeah, so, you know, those are some of the points that we try to bring across to people, um, you know, the importance of that, you know, we we shouldn't be the top, in the top 20 of um, something like that. Could you repeat repeat those numbers again? I'm sorry, I just want to... Yeah, that's no problem. um, You know, we have in in an average year, 908 people die and about 1,700 are wounded to gun violence in South Carolina. Um, South Carolina wow. has the 13th highest rate of gun violence in the U.S. Um, and, and I'm just kind of, my head turned because I'm looking at stats. Um, in South Carolina, the rate of gun deaths increased by 42% from 2010, 2010 to 2019 compared to a 17% increase nationwide. You know, you know, when Ashley talked about numbers, you know, I don't know the numbers always offhand. Honestly, I don't want to remember them because it's too scary to remember those numbers because at the end of the day, I know my child is a part of that number. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's scary to believe that every day someone's added to that number. And that's as of 2019. I mean, we have all of 2020 that if we add those numbers in in just this first quarter of 2021, I mean, it's just astounding. I mean, it actually really feels like we're about, feels like we're in December right now, although we just about to wrap up March because that's just how heavy it's felt thus far mm-hmm. this year. Yeah. So Jelena, I actually have kind of a, a question that goes with that. So we're talking about the number of deaths and you hear people say, well, that's exactly why I want a gun is to protect uh-huh. myself. So how, how do we discuss this issue with people like that? How do we convince them that them buying a gun isn't actually making anybody safer in well, the situation? I, I can add to that because when we talk about those, those statistics, 50%, 56% of them are suicides. 45, 41% are um, homicides and about 2% unintentional and about 1% undetermined and 1% um, police shootings. But look, 50, 56% of those people cause harm to themselves. So when you think about the stats, 40 something percent was homicide. Um, and, and I think that that's a whole nother ball of wax, but 56% was probably someone who made a snap decision based on, you know, I wait three days versus I wait seven days. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have a chance to think about that breakup with my significant other was not as serious as I thought it was. That that loss of that job was um, not as devastating as me just, you know what, I think I can go on a new career path. I mean, um, not giving a person the the time to think about the decision they're about to make. Um, So I think it can be two folds. I mean, people are always going to find a negative in something if they're are passionate about it and and like we all said you know i believe I, I have friends who are law enforcement i have friends who own guns i mean but it's just about the way you handle it and how you operate with it yes criminals will always get their hands on a gun but you know when we use that be smart acronym smart secure you know you want to make, keep it secure model safe behavior ask for the presence of gun you want to recognize the role in gun suicide you want to tell it appears to be smart smart means lock your doors so that way the criminals who wanted those guns they don't just open it up and take it out and just use it for whatever they want to and then you know that helps to solve some of that pro- some of those problems we can't we know that gun violence is not going to be like you know we hope for it but we know it's not going to be at zero percent ever in life it's just not a fact i mean that's the reality of world the world but if we can reduce it by 15%, 20%, 30%, we've accomplished something and we could have saved the life of 
you know, your loved one who may have felt bad that day and not, or a teenager who just was depressed or some type of mental um, health crisis, or that family member who just went to the grocery store to get, get a gallon of milk because we ran out, I need it for the morning, that someone sized open fire, you know? So those are the things we're trying to prevent. Um, and honestly, I find it hard for people to, that they fight it so hard, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and we don't want it to happen. Me as a me as a gun violence survivor, I would never want anybody to be put in the same shoes that I am mm-hmm. um, to, to bury your child, to bury your loved one. So if it makes someone mad because I say it, then you know I hope you never have to live what I live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, you've touched on a couple of issues that um, that, that I kind of want to bring up. Uh, I, for, I want to mention one of the things is that, that historically gun control laws have often disproportionately targeted and affected minority communities. How do we make sure that any new legislation that comes up, that it doesn't do that? I mean, how do we, how do we enact, enact legislation fairly? That's a tough one. Cause when I think about that South Carolina permitless carry um, bill, um, I, I've seen some of the comments from the state house, and I've seen black lawmakers argue the point because, you know, when you look like me and my my average African American male, that's yes, permitless carry. Yeah, he he has the right to own a gun, and he actually owns it legally. But will he be treated the same as a, his white counterparty if he's walking with his gun open carry? Will will this African-American, a black and brown young man, a young woman get stopped and questioned to prove that they have the right to own it versus their white counterparties. Those are the fears and then the reaction of people thinking because maybe I'm, you know, bigger than the normal. I may look like the, you know, the, um, the, the, the bodybuilder and I may look intimidating to you, but now you put a gun on my hip as a male. Now, I was fearful and because when, like you said, Wild Wild West, mm-hmm. I mean, people, a lot of people, re, they react before they think. And that's where yeah. the, um, that's where the scary part comes in. Mm-hmm. I mean, permitless carry, just, I'm, honestly, I just don't even know where the insanity came from that decision. But I, I just don't think it's good for people. Somebody's going to get hurt and you don't want to get, Yeah. It, it, it makes me angry. <laughs> it's yeah. very difficult to determine good guy, bad guy in that circumstance too. Uh, and, and this is, that goes into your last question, but it's also one of the reasons that I am, am against this as well. I mean, it's, it doesn't make me feel safer to be in any place to see someone open carrying. I mean, I will admit I'm a sensitive person and it, it makes me nervous that people are even concealed. I mean, I'm not a gun owner for a variety of reasons. I've said, stated very clearly, I've been mentally ill for 14 years. So that's one of the reasons I do not own um, a firearm, uh, but I am supportive. I have family members that do. And I've been told stories of people that, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, hear a noise and you grab that and you, unintentional accidental things happen all the time as well. But also, I just, you know, the, growth, the, the the situation in Boulder was most recently something very heavy for me because I think about going to the grocery store myself or I think about my, my spouse shops most of the time and that just, it was just a really rough day for me. Um, Tisa mentioned re-traumatized and that was just a really hard moment to think, oh great, another place, you know, and, and the other side of that is one of the individuals first killed in that incident was the first officer on the scene correct me if i'm wrong um y'all but and and that's technically a good guy with a gun you know um going into this wild west situation like you mentioned um joanna i i I don't know there's just so many variables and nuances to it that adding more openness could not possibly be the correct solution here um and i just kind of keep going back to to that as 
we don't necessarily have to strip everyone of their of their right, but we definitely need to have some kind of, you know, common sense regulation. Right. And so someone, just a regular person can go to the store with their kids or go to wherever with their with their family or just on their own and 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 not feel afraid that the man in front of the line of them at Subway or wherever, you know, carrying it, is that a good guy? Is that not a good guy? And if someone walks in and doesn't think he's a good guy, am I going to be in a situation constantly thinking that stuff? And for gun violence survivors, we're constantly thinking that stuff. Um, and, the, and we're basically a nation of gun, survi- uh, gun violence survivors at this point, because the statistic is something like 60 something percent of people know someone who has been impacted by gun violence, which is if you do like the six degrees of separation, that's an awful lot of people. I mean, I, I will fully admit, I know a lot more than the average person, but that's because of the advocacy work that I do. But, you know, you think about that and people are going into these into stores and into school. Um, I read an article recently, I do a lot of reading on this stuff and it's something about Gen Z, one of their top fears is being shot in their school and in their classroom. That is ridiculous. That is a completely unacceptable fear for for students of any age and teachers and staff, you know? So that's kind of what I'm thinking, like more (laughs) openness to this stuff. I was gonna create more fears and more, uh, to go to your point, Amber, more kind of that protective thing that people feel. I don't necessarily think continuing to arm folks is the solution Mm -hmm. to feeling protected um and i realize it's a very murky gray area um for a lot of reasons and i don't really have a singular thing i don't think it's a singular thing i think it's a series of things that will i don't know help us in this situation i hope that made some kind of sense (laughs) i mean i think it's among our lessons from our own you know, nuclear arms race with Russia, we saw how that ended. It ended and we just all had to stop, right? We had to back off, take your foot off the pedal and say, this was really a losing proposition, right? That nobody, this is a lose-lose situation. Let's all just back off, cool it, move on. And I mean, I kind of think we, we should take that, that tactic internally, right? With our own nation, because as citizens, we have to live together right? That requires a tremendous amount of trust, right? Trust in, in our, our legal systems, trust in our social institutions, trust that like when I hand you $5, you're going to give me my cheeseburger, right? And, and, and so we need to trust that when we enter public spaces that we can trust each other as fellow citizens, you know, that we're, yeah. that, that, that we're not going to shoot each other. And right now we can't do that. And I can see why Gen Z is, is terrified because, uh, you know, this, the shootings have just escalated in, in the last, you know, two decades. I, this, you know, when I was in elementary school, I won't say what decade that was, but <laughs> it was not on my radar. That was, we were more worried about tornadoes and fire drills and natural yeah. death. We don't exactly. need to anything else to the list of things that could possibly go wrong when it's, we could, when we could do things differently. Yeah, the earthquake drill is what we look forward to. Um, now, um, like you said, Gen X, I was listening to one of the news broadcasts last week when they talked about the Boulder, Colorado incident and the young man was on the news and he this he's never known anything different than school shooting drills. And I can't even imagine, you know, going in that because I, I, you know, years and years, you remember hearing about the first time it ever happened, like in that type of situation, it was like, wow what's going on it's like something never heard of and now it's more common than you know than ever imaginable and and that's really sad that we have a generation that's growing up and and they do these um school drills with their eyes closed because they're so used to it um it's frightening it, it definitely is um and, and like Ashley said, I, I don't think there's like one solution to it all. I think we all need to remember, um, and I think someone said it earlier, that um, gun violence just doesn't affect just the individual people, you know, the, the impact of my life, the impact of Ashley's life, the impact of Marcel, but it affects the community because that six degrees of separation is so important because for that loved one that died, 
their in instances brothers sons daughters nieces nephews friends and the amount of people that one incident can impact is so tremendous and in charleston we did this um event and we was bringing awareness um in june to wear orange about gun violence and we did this scenario where i said that things are i named three things i was a mother a, um a sister an advocate and each person named those three things they did and we pointed and and think about just those three things that represent that's the three different things a part of my role is impacted a part of other people's roles impacted when you go around the room about 50 or more people and you just the magnitude of the things that gun violence has impacted it's so tremendous um i think just a lot of people got to get out of their heads the part of where people are trying to take something away from them i mean we live in a society that feels so privileged that we must have everything and we want it our way. And, you know, you know, we don't want to wait for anything. And, and it's allowed us to disconnect from the reality of things. So it's kind of like getting back to the basics in, in life in general. Mm -hmm. So I'll just add that too. Yeah. I was really hoping that the pandemic was going to do that. I've enjoyed that year of of no mass shootings. It was great. And then I was like, and then when it happened at Atlanta, and then Boulder, I was like, ah, you know, it's, yeah. it was nice to not have that, you know, for a period of time. Of course, people were still suffering from gun violence in other ways. And from, from what I understand, did the statistics actually go up during the pandemic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and that's due as a result of, is that both suicides and interpersonal gun violence? Both went yeah. up. Domestic violence um, incidents related to gun violence went up as well because now you have those um, incidents where people are closed in together more often. And, you know, that gun, um, domestic violence, gun violence definitely increased during the pandemic period. Yeah, and that's terrifying. I can't imagine being stuck at home, like in quarantine with somebody who's like, you know, might shoot you. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's horrible. There's nowhere to go. Exactly. Mm -hmm with job loss and the other tensions that come up across. I mean, and also um, unintentional shootings with children. I mean, because mm -hmm. um, uh, a model that people always, used to say, it was a pastor here that always said, when the kids can find the Christmas presents, believe me, they already know where the gun that you're trying to hide is at. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I read another headline today about a child going to find their parents' gun when they said they were gonna go, you know, get a, a you know, video game or something and went and got like guns. We see those headlines a lot here in this, I mean, all over the country, um, but we see those headlines and those unintentional. Um, and then another piece I wanted to bring up is this, it's one of the reasons I say school shooting about my experience, just because those are such a small percentage mass shootings happen every single day in every community. It's just some of them because they're in specific areas or specific just specific incidents get pushed to the front, get pushed to social media, get pushed to a, to a hashtag. But, you know, statistically, the mass, shoot, mass shootings are a shooting where, I believe it's four or more, um, are impacted, either shot or impacted by a, a shooting. And so we think about it from that perspective. And I, I know that that can be a debated on both sides. Um, calling mass shootings and using that statistic. And it's one of the reasons that I, like I said, I specifically say um, school shooting or campus shooting for my, for my incident. Um, but anyway, just for what it's worth, I, I can't imagine that we did not have mass shootings throughout the, the year um, of this pandemic, but all of a sudden they're happening in these very highly visible and highly public areas and, and, are, and are tracked and are brought to our attention. And that's when a lot of people, self-included, kind of wake up and pay attention. I mean, I haven't watched the, <laughs> the news very easily for a very long time. So it has to kind of rise to the, to the top a little bit for even me to see stuff on a, on a daily basis. And so that's extremely sad to me that there are shootings, that 100 people are dying of, of gun violence every single day. Um, and we're, we're only getting a small percentage um, of the 
a good publicity for lack of a better word of those gun deaths and and yeah we go back to the suicide thing i mean that's three <laughs> two-thirds of gun violence um are, are suicides and are people that like tisa was saying you know just means in a moment and and there's sometimes very little that can be done um about about that moment um except to not have the means mm -hmm. and that's what we've seen a lot in this pandemic as well as people at a very very low um moment in time mm -hmm. that also have the means and then mention the um domestic domestic violence incident i mean you're also in a situation where one of the other pieces of legislation that would be helpful is the ability to remove guns from a situation in which you are unsafe mm -hmm. if you're unsafe in your home you should be able to help yourself um it, you should be able to call or <laughs> initiate some kind of action to remove a, a you know a deadly tool that could end up hurting you or your children or, or your entire family um, in that type of situation. And, and that's another common sense piece of legislation that, that moms has worked on in the past and in other states, for sure. I think in Virginia, Marcel, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that they have some, some legislation like that. So there's so many layers to this and there's so many people that, that walk so different paths of gun violence. That's why I bring up that pie chart thing a little bit because it's just one big picture, but there's different solutions for different slices. Um, and it's just a matter of kind of chipping away at it and, and making it all better for all of us. And I fully agree with you, Jelena, we need to trust each other again. And I feel like that's a huge piece of this, a huge philosophical piece of this. That's wow. very difficult to tackle. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, and you, but you also, uh, you know, mentioned the fact that like the Tisa's statistic of 908 people per year in South Carolina, I did the math, that's two and a half people per day die mm -hmm. as a result of gun violence. So two and a half people today, just to, just as today has passed. And so it's like, if we knew that, right? If the, why isn't it in the news? You know, it's probably because it's so common that it's almost not newsworthy, right? And that's heartbreaking, right? That's devastating that people can die as a result of an entirely preventable, you know, we can't prevent cancer yet. You know, we can't, you know, we got heart disease, we've got, you know, lung, lung cancer, we have lot, lots of other health problems that we can't prevent, but this is entirely preventable. And we could, you know, if we had the, the will, the knowledge, the, the, the motivation that, you know, we could, we could try to do something about it. Um, one thing I want to uh, just wrap up with, uh, I, I just looked at the clock and I realized, oh my gosh, we've been here for almost an hour. So this has been great. But one thing I want to wrap up with is um, the relationship of gun violence to mental health. So one of the things that people often know is that mental health is one reason, right, for mass shootings and gun violence, that this is why it takes place. Um, and for example, in, in 2010, the CDC noted that guns accounted for 61% of all suicides, which one, that's a statistic that we've talked about. That being said, it seems that gun violence and mental health really need to be treated as two separate issues. So my mom's a psychologist and so she she does mental health for her, you know, that's that's as a living. And you know, she has some patients that um, might have violent tendencies and she's had other patients, you know, who um, you know, have lost family members as a result of gun violence. But those are really not always two overlapping circles. Like if we were going to draw the Venn diagram, right, of gun violence and mental health, like there's some overlap, but it's not the same two same circles. So um, how do we how do we address how do we address um, the issue of uh, of of just making sure that these are two separate issues? What's the most um, the best way to talk about that and, and having sort of a, a public health campaign. Did I freeze up again? No, you didn't freeze. I think we all just, I think we all just, <laughs> y'all are all, our wheels thinking, turning. all just, yeah. I mean, our wheels are turning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the main problem, and this is, 
you know, one of the things that the pandemic has really brought to light is that our access to mental health is not great, right? I mean, we live in a country where if you're poor, you know, you're working hard, you've got to go back to work at Walmart because like you don't have any other options, right? You're going to have to work. You're going to be super stressed out because you're having a hard time feeding your family. But what are your options? It's easier for you to gun, get a gun than it is for you to go to a therapist. I mean, that's telling. That is yeah. telling that we don't offer the resources. And my, of course, my mom has like a sliding scale, but like the stigma, right, of going to a mental health counselor or something like that is the second thing that you have to come up, overcome, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to finding time, right, when you're working your 40 hour job trying to support your family, um, coming up with some sort of money or not. And, and then finally, people not making fun of you. And I feel like one possible good thing that's come out of the pandemic is that we've recognized that mental health is precarious and any of us can be in a situation where we're all of a sudden like, oh my God, I can't do this. Like, I can't manage this, this is hard. And as y'all are talking about the interpersonal violence over the past year has skyrocketed skyrocketed because we people don't have the skills. I mean, I was I was I was having a hard time and I'm somebody who has worked really hard, right? To be to be stable. I have a, I still had a job, right? Had a flexible job. Like I had it great compared to most people. It was hard, right? It's hard for all of us. So like it's 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 very frustrating to me that like we don't offer, you know, we don't make the same um, for get help, you know, when they need it. Yeah, so anyway, you know, sorry, I was on my foot there. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. I think you made some good points there because one thing mental health, um, it is sometimes considered um, a stigma in, in communities. Um, and, and most people like to point out black and brown communities, but I don't think it's just black and brown. I think it's a society in general, um, maybe more prevalent in one in black and brown communities because it's kind of like we fix things ourselves we don't need a counselor to fix us i can tell you right now i thought i had it together um a year or so later after my son was murdered i was like you know what i need some help i'm not i'm i'm it looks like i'm handling this well i mean even tonight you know people may say wow i can't believe she talked about the death of her son and she did not fall apart and people expect you to but you know, mental health doesn't always show on the out or outward side. Sometimes it's just internal and we internalize things and we, we struggle with things, but we have to have somebody to talk to. I mean, through the work that I've been doing, we even have a, um, we have a um, bi-weekly um, counseling, group counseling, and we have a, a, a licensed therapist come in and we talk to um, families and, and victims of gun violence and survivors um, because we know it's needed. If we show up whether it's one person, that, me and the doctor in the Zoom meeting or me, the doctor and 50 people, because you know, on those days, I just get my one-on-one -on -one sessions. <laughs> but I, I, I think that the mental health aspect is so important. And I think you're right. Um, the US showed us, showed us ugly hand in how we handle medical disparities amongst communities. And in the mental health of people, you know, every time you hear about the incidents, you hear about even the guy in, um, in Boulder, he had, his family described that he had issues with mental health. Um, but also when you have what they call, I guess, homicides and, and, and gun violence, which they would call maybe city gun violence, urban gun violence, there's mental health issues involved there too. Mm -hmm. It's just not as, as widely spoken about because it's just like, oh, well, it's poverty and stuff. But a lot of that stems from mental health issues, um, mm -hmm. um, mental instability, um, financial ins instability, those things. And, and it's a perception that um, gun violence only happens to people in those, um, in, a, in a low poverty neighborhood. And it, it's not true. It's just the, the, the unconscious bias that people play on things because they don't know enough about it or they don't care to learn about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think every one of us could use some type of mental health. Um, um, even if we're having a good day, it's good to talk to people about how you feel. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to, the access needs to be there. I mean, I heard you talk about your mom and she used a sliding scale. And there's so many mental health care providers that are willing to offer their services for free. 
because they know it will help someone. But we have to make it make a society where people aren't afraid to share that they're not doing okay. Um, so that's where the unintentional, yeah. um, excuse me, that's where the suicides and um, and um, attempts come in and successful attempts come at because people just don't feel like they have a place to go. And that gun makes it more accessible for um, a temporary problem and they make a permanent decision. This is a soapbox issue for me that could probably yeah. be another yeah. an hour of talking. <laughs> um, but I, I like, I look at this a big picture, but I also look at this as small scale. I mean, how, yes, in the stigma. And I personally work on ending the stigma by being very, very transparent about my own experiences with everyone. I'm in higher ed and I have access to however many students I have access to and my colleagues and people and being just almost at the risk sometime of oversharing, but letting people know that they aren't alone in how they're feeling. They aren't alone in thinking that this pandemic was hard. I think we all really have an opportunity to look out for each other. And that looks very different for every single person. Um, I will personally say that, you know, my mental health declined and it was fairly gradual. Um, there was, you know, this moment where someone was like, you're just not, you okay? And, and I got to like day eight T5 where someone asked me if I was okay. And I'm like, mm, no, I'm not. And it's a matter of people paying attention. And I think that that's kind of a small scale. I always call this like termite activism a little bit, like very small scale kind of gnaw away at the, the everyday conversations and paying attention to the people in your life. And I think my mind always goes back to that during when these large incidents happen, these very public incidents. I'm, and I hear a story about, the family said this or so-and-so said this <laughs> keep saying stuff keep bringing it up um keep telling people this isn't like a narc or whistleblower type of thing but there, if something's off something's off and maybe someone just needs to be told in a very gentle kind way you know something seems off and you never know what you could be impacting by just having that kind of person-to-person -person conversation with folks. So that's, there's a bigger scale of access, which I fully, totally agree with. And I've been very, very privileged, but there's also the small day-to-day -day things that we can all do yeah. um, to help out and kind of pay attention to each other. So that's my contribution. That's great. That's great. So we've come to the point now where I want to hear to tell uh, about how people can get involved. So if people are interested in joining um, either Moms Demand Action or, uh, or Every Town for Gun Safety. Um, what can people do? What are you guys working on? And where, where, where can they find you? We're going to let Marcel take this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marcel. <laughs> I'll be glad to. Well, you can text 64433. And I can't, what, I can't remember all the ways you can text. I need Ashley or Tisa to help me. I think the easiest way myself is to go into the internet and just Google Moms Demand Action. And there's, that's a very simple way to get involved. There's a fabulous website. And Every Town for Gun Safety is actually sort of the research arm of Moms Demand Action. Moms Demand Action has the events and you know encourages you to do action where every town is kind of, it's the umbrella group that's over Moms Demand Action, as well as the Every Town Survivor Network. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'd say that'd be probably the easiest way. And then you, you can be involved, is getting involved in a local group. Like we have a local group here in Myrtle Beach. There are nine local groups in South Carolina. But for those who aren't into, you know, at their time of life, not being involved, maybe in a, in a actually attending meetings. Of course, we've been doing virtual meetings during the pandemic, but you can also be part of, a, of the, it's called GSAN. It's a group that you just, uh, you're volunteering by phone calling uh, just right at your home. You can choose a time that's convenient for you and you can get involved into uh, by welcoming people that have expressed interest in moms or during uh, political campaigns, you can, be involved with uh, telephone calling related to that. So um, awesome. 
that would be my suggestion is just just Google Moms Demand Action and you'll get plenty of, okay. there'll be plenty of ways right there if they're simple to follow and you get in, to get involved. Yeah. Okay. And, and one more thing, um, just coming up, we have a um, statewide event um, um, on the program that we talked about early, the Be Smart program. It's going to be a virtual event on um, April the 13th and statewide. And you can go through your um, um, through the internet and find your local Moms Demand Action um, events in South Carolina. But also just one last note for um, me and Ashley, you know, we, we told you at the beginning that we are every town survivor fellows. Um, Ashley's a senior fellow, this is my second year. But one thing you can do is people can text honor to 64433. And in honor our loved one's memory, honor our um, experiences with gun violence. And, and that will connect you um, to, you'll get a text back and it connect you with your local Moms Demand Action organization. Um, and you can get involved and being involved doesn't mean that you have to always be in presence of people, but you can always do, you know, there's lots of things to do because, um, you know, many hands make for light work and we got a lot of work to do across the state of South Carolina. So um, I just want right. to leave us with that. Thank you, Tisa. That's the perfect thing to end up with. And Tisa, while I'm thinking about it, your, your uh, organization, We Are Their Voices, do you have a, like a website or a Facebook page? Yes, we, like I said, Yes, we do. It's, you can go to We Are Their Voices. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, you can go to wearetheirvoices.com and you can find us on the internet. And I think maybe my internet is unstable now. <laughs> yeah, That's okay. I think my internet froze on me this time, but you can go to, you can go to wearetheirvoices.com and that'll connect you with us. And I mean, and, and if you have a Right now we have a scholarship um, that we are offering out to high school seniors in the um, area of the Charleston and some of our area and districts two, two and four. So, um, but you can find out what we're doing and we can be found on Facebook and Instagram under We Are Their Voices as well. Um, awesome. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Tisa. All right, so I'm gonna end on that. Many hands make light work. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for all you're doing to uh, uh, pro make us safer here in South Carolina. So. Ashley, Amber, Marcel, Tisa, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And this is Jelena Oxley with Grand Strand Action Together. And I'm signing off and wishing you all an excellent Tuesday. Thank you again, everybody. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.